Okay, welcome. My name is Ben Conway. I'm the lead pastor of True of Life Church, and this is uh, one of our leadership uh, seminars, Effective Leadership. I believe this is session four or five. I don't actually know. Um, I'll make sure it's labeled properly when we upload it to YouTube. But today I want to talk about something really important. What is the test of leadership? What is the test of leadership? And the answer is very simple. The test of leadership is change. Change. Can you make change happen? Can you handle change when it does happen outside of your control? We've looked at what leadership is, it's influence. Uh, we've looked at our main job as leaders to set priorities. We've looked at the character of leadership. So this is our set fourth session, session four. And the question today is, what is effective leadership? Effective leadership is change, okay? So if you're taking notes, effective leadership is change, Okay, can you take a group of people, whether it's a small group in your, your, your house, your living church, whether it's your own business, whether it's a church, whether it's your department in your business, whether it's your family, or if your mom or dad, and this is your, you and your mom and you, know, you and your husband and wife and your children, can you take that group of people and change them for the better? If so, you've passed leadership, you've done leadership. That's all leadership is. Can you create momentum in people's lives can you help them walk in their dreams? Can you help them develop their capacity to be a better human? Then that's leadership. That's what leadership is. That, you see, leadership is influence. Good leadership is influence people to a good place, to change them to be better. That's it, okay? Can you change a culture? Now, there's a real test of leadership. Can you take a church, a group of churches, where you've got 40 different nationalities, and some of those, you know, just because we've got Ugandans, I know there's different kinds of Ugandan, different tribes, you know, a Scouse is not the same as, as a Brummie, and, um, you know, as a Geordie, as a Jock, they're, they're no one's the same, even though they're from the same nation or from the same group of nations, okay? We have our different cultures, our different ages, our different generations, our different way of thinking. Some people have come to Tree of Life from a Baptist background. Uh, a lot of people come from the crazy charismatic end of things, you know, wanting to shout at devils all night and do this and do that. Can we take all those people, diverse groups and um, diverse things, and can we change them for the better? And here's the truth. Okay, leading people into change is hard. Do you know why? Because people don't want to change. People don't like change. There's a very instinctive level in every person that we don't like change. It's a very famous two panel cartoon. The person says, who wants change? And puts a hand up, we want change, we want change. And then he asks the question, second panel, who wants to change? And no one puts their hand up. That's a brilliant picture of what it's like leading people. We all want the benefits of change. We all want to be in a bigger church. We all want the more peace in our life. We all want more victory. We all want more prosperity. But what we don't want is the pain of changing to that place. And so I want to understand what I'm saying here. So we need to help, as leaders, we need to help people overcome that pain and get to a place of change and make that choice to change. And we need to influence them as leaders into making that change, okay? And that's good leadership. Uh, so wh why do people resist change? The more you can understand why people don't want to change, the more you can create change. So as a pastor of Tree of Life, I want to change Tree of Life. I want to change Tree of Life Dagnum from being 100. And, it's about 100 people now after lockdown. It's about 130 before lockdown. And there's a lot more online viewers. So it's about the same number of people, but some people are not coming out for various reasons. So let's say we're 120 people. If I want to change it to 120 people to 250 people, I want to double the size of the church, I want to change it, okay? Why do some people not want to change? Why do some people resist that? Why can some people not dream that? Why are some people not wanting to grow? Why is it people have left our church every season of growth we've had, okay? Um, and if I can understand that as a pastor, I can help lead people to change better, okay? And if you can understand why people resist change, you can help people change it in, in church, in business, whatever, better. So the number one reason people don't like change, number one, reason number one, doing something new is awkward. Doing something new is hard work. Do me a favor. Take your hands and clasp them together like that. Put your two palms together and interlock your fingers, okay? Has everyone done it? Yeah? Well, you can't type you have, can you? Because you've done it, okay? Now, when you do that, you have a natural hand that's on top. In other words, every time you do that, every single time you do that, automatically, instinctively, without thinking, one of your hands is the top one. For me, it's my right hand, my right fingers on top there, okay? And so um, that's instinctive. 
Now take your hands apart, and this time deliberately do it the other way. Doesn't quite feel right, does it? Doesn't quite feel natural. Do you know why? It's it's, it's not any different, is it? It's not any that, that that's not different from that. But I'm used to that. That's what I normally have. This this is new. I I don't want the new. It doesn't feel comfortable. I'm going to go back to the old, if that's okay. When I first started going to the gym, that was a very alien environment to me. I didn't know where to begin. I felt very uncomfortable. I didn't know what to do there. I didn't know how to act there. When I first went to church as a 16-year-old boy, exactly the same. I didn't know how to behave. Uh, everything was new, and it felt awkward. You have to realize that for somebody who spends Sunday doing whatever they want, to make a decision to spend every Sunday in church is awkward for them. It's, it's, it's uncomfortable. It's, it, it's not familiar. To get someone to change from taking all their money and blowing it the second they get paid, to taking 10% and giving it to the church, to taking some and saving it, to taking some and giving it to World Mission, that's tricky because it's new. Now, to get someone to go to a small group every week and be part of a small group every week, that's difficult. Now, not every change is an improvement. Not every change is for the better. Okay, so I want to understand that. But if you want to improve, if you want to be better, you have to change. There has to be changes. I've had to change my diet in the last two or three years. And uh, I want to go, I still, three years later, four years later of dieting, I still want to go back to the old diet. Not just because it tasted better, and it did, let's face it, but because it's familiar. It's taken a lot of time to get used to the change. And it will take you time to get used to changes you make. And if your whole group's changing, it feels awkward. Most people, now they, they might not say this out loud. You might not say this out loud, but this is how most people are. They would rather have a familiar problem than a novel solution. Let me say that again. Most people would rather have a familiar problem than a novel solution, because what's novel, what's new, is not known. What's new makes me feel uncomfortable. We're like Linus. Remember Linus from Peanuts? Some of you will, some of you won't, but Linus was a little cartoon, uh, Peanuts was a cartoon strip, Snoopy. Linus had this blanket, and he could never put the blanket down, because it was his blanket. It was familiar, you know? And we need to deal with that part of change. You know, it's awkward to put down the blanket. It's awkward to give up. You know, when, when, when a living church grows, and uh, you know, I what we call our small groups in Tree of Life, and suddenly it's 15 people and it's too big for, to, to get the benefits of a small group, it's too big to fit in someone's living room. Um, and we say, right, we're gonna become two groups. People fight, people get so upset. I'm like, well, we wanna bless more people, feed more people. I'm only saying for two hours of every 168 hours in a week, you have to be in different houses. You can be in each other's houses the other 166 hours, but it's a change It's because it's new. It's new. And so when you realize that and you understand that and you appreciate that, then when you initiate change, you have to be very aware that this is going to be the attitude you're going to get. People aren't going to want to change. Okay. So that's important, you know, because I, I want everything to change. I want to plant more churches. I want to get more people in leadership. I want to double the size of all our churches. I want to change tree of life radically. And so because of that, I have to then be aware. Most people don't want to change. Most people just want to come to church and it's the same. That's what they want deep down because of this. Has everyone understood that? Has that helped? Okay. So that's the number thing. Doing something new is all. The second is most, most people, when they hear the word change, what's going on in their head is they see loss. Okay. When you say, if you go to work, right, and they say, it's, again, it's a mindset issue. If you go to work um, Monday morning and they say, right, we're going to do a restructure. Restructure is the work, the business word for change. We're going to do a restructure. Okay. First question, your mind, how will it affect me? What will it cost me? What am I going to lose? What am I going to have to give up? Okay. And it's the same in the church. If I go up and go, all the pastor and say, we're going to restructure. Okay. We're, we're moving a couple of people around um, at the start of 2021. And I know the first thought in people's mind, well, what's it going to cost me? What am I going to give up? Because what, what we give up, we can already have. We can see it. We can feel it. It's there. But what we're going to get, that's just a dream right now. That's just a vision right now. 
And it's hard to say, well, we're going to get this and this when all we've got is this. It's hard. We, 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 we've just had a few people who, who uh, in one of our church plants, and uh, they, they, they come to our church plant. We love this. We love the teaching. We've been set free. We've been healed. We've been helped. But then they, they've retreated back, and I, I'll use the word retreat. I'm happy to call it that, to their old church because it's safe, because it's normal, because it's the same. And I understand that they feel uncomfortable in Tree of Life because we're not quite like some other churches. Okay. Now I value that. I value our distinctiveness, but it's awkward. Okay. And so most people, when you think about change, if you're about to make a life change, well, you're going to start your own business. Okay. And you're going to quit your job, which pays your mortgage. And you're not going to start your own business. There's something in your mind. I want to lose. Them. You see, cause we, we, we define life in terms of gain and loss. And that's great. But when it comes to change, someone, a leader, a good leader helps point out, helps paint the picture of what you would gain. One of the most brilliant leaders in the 20th century was Martin Luther King, a remarkable leader. Okay. And what, 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 he was a good leader because not only was he a good leader, an effective leader, a good leader, but he was a good man where he led people to was a good place. Okay, but he pet continually. If you, you look at his writings, he, he didn't preach hate, he didn't preach death, he didn't preach all that. He preached a better tomorrow. I dream of a day, I have a dream. Let me tell you where we're going. This is the benefits. Yes, we're going to lose something, and people wouldn't want to lose something, people want to change because people are just naturally resisting to change. Okay, and again, for a lot of people, it's not so much that person's a racist. I'm not, I'm not, it's not going to feel any different if you're being treated differently because of the color of your skin. But it's just that this is the way it's always been done. This is the way it's going to be done. And mine was, no, I've got a better dream. I've got a better idea. My son's going to be judged by the content of the character and the color of the skin. And he presented this better future. And that's good leadership. But to, to emphasize the gains we're going to get. Okay? The truth is, this is the truth. You cannot gain anything without losing something. Even if your gain is a hundred percent increase, you've still lost something. Okay. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say we turn up at your church tomorrow. Okay. Whether it's Guildford, Dorset, Brentwood, Watford, Dagenham, whichever one, right? You turn up at church tomorrow. So it's Sunday and you turn up at church and there's a hundred new people just walked in the door. Right, that, that, that's change. I, I, I think that we'd all celebrate that. I think that, you know, I'd be getting texts by the pastor, you know, Richard would be texting me, Lee or Elaine Cowell would text me, well, I've got 100 new people, 100 new people. You know, but I don't know what we gain from that 100 new people. Do you know what we lose? We lose church like it is right now. We lose, it's lost forever. The relationships will change. You're gonna have to have different friends. People, people, the way people relate to each other is gonna change. The dynamics of the service are gonna change. The, the which living church people are gonna go to is gonna change. Everything's gonna change. And it's going to be uncomfortable to change. And one of the main reasons that churches don't grow is people get comfortable and there's not a leader inspiring people for the gains. Look what we're going to get. People hold on very tightly to what they have, the current, the now, which means they miss out on their future. And a, a, a great part of leadership is helping people deal with this attitude and realize that we can dream bigger, we can be something more, we can be together something more, and we can change, and we can get there, okay? Now, within any organization, okay, any group of people, whether it's your workplace, whether it's your family, whether it's Tree of Life Church, okay, I'm using Tree of Life Church as a bit of an illustration, because that's what I know, okay? Some people, because they're experienced in life, some people because their personality, some because of other factors, some people embrace change quicker than others. It's like a bell curve. You understand a bell curve? Some people really, really, but very, very small percentage of people really, really love change. They get upset if things don't change. Average number of people, most people indifferent to change. I'd rather not, but you can inspire them and lead them to change. And then at the other end of the bell curve, there's some people who will never change. They're the same people who, if they're around a couple hundred years ago, they'd be moaning about electric light bulbs, okay? We like the gas. We like the gas, okay? The, 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 those kind of people are always going to be with us, okay? And so everyone's going to have a different reaction to change, okay? We're, and we're, we're, some of us find it a lot easier to throw things away than others. Now, I want to let you know, I'm at the I love change end of the spectrum, okay? 
I have just thrown away a whole bunch of clothes I just don't fit into anymore. And man's like, did you want to hold on to them? No, because I'm never going back to being that big again. I'm never going to wear those clothes again. They're out the door. And then we've got the old clothes out from years ago that I used to not be able to fit into and now I can fit into. But I'm like, let's throw half of these out, man. Some of these are, I bought these when I was a poor man. These are poor man's clothes. I'll throw them in the bin. Some of these are 10 years out of date. Oh, man, did people dress like that? Throw them in the, you know, I'm happy to throw everything out and start again. I'm always, I'm, I'm happy to start in the new church. I'm happy doing the new thing. Okay. That, that, that's where I am. But the, 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 these, these, these things like that reveal your attitude. When you buy new clothes, do you throw the old ones away? Or other people keep everything. I might need it one day. I might need it one day. Because we have different reactions to change. We handle change and process change differently. Okay. And the problem is this, all of us, every one of us, even me, even you, every one of us has thinking inside us that restricts our ability to move forward. We have ideas that hold us back. That they're like burdens, weights in our mind, outdated ideas, practices that are not useful for you, information that's not true, ideas about God that you've embraced but never thought through, never really realized isn't biblical. And any ideas that haven't been examined and looked at could be in our mind just sitting there holding us back. And they impact us, and they impact everyone else around us. And they impact the results we get. And the impact, and the only solution is to go into your brain the same way you should go into your wardrobe and, and throw some stuff away. Say, that doesn't fit me anymore. I'm too big to have that thought now. Uh, um, that, that thought was great in my last church, but I'm a tree of life now. That, that, that idea of how to do things was great in my last company, but I'm not there anymore. That company doesn't exist. So many of us are holding on to stuff that just doesn't fit anymore. We had a guy um, in one of our churches and... Uh, there was a church somewhere in the country, somewhere where we don't have a tree of life at all. And every time I made a decision, this guy would challenge me and go, well, this church here does this, and this church here does that, and this church here, and this church is the perfect church, and this church this. And every idea, he held me up against the stand of this church. And I said to him one day, I said, I said listen, it's not be rude, but the guy just lost his job. I don't know, you lost your job. Your children have both finished full-time education. There's nothing holding you to here. Why don't you move to that church, move to that area, move to that church? It seems to me you really, really love that church and you'd be happier in that church than Tree of Life. And I want you to be happy. I want you to be an effective Christian. And I don't think you've been very effective here. And, and he eventually started to cry. And he basically said to me, that church closed, doesn't exist anymore. I thought, well, what, what, why, why do you keep comparing me? Why do you want me to act like a church that closed? You know, there's a reason that church closed because the way it acted, the decisions it made. Churches don't close by accident. But again, change, there's this, this reluctance to change. People won't leave a dying church. It's, it takes a lot before people walk out of a church. If they're, if they're established in it, you know, especially if it's a traditional denomination. Well, I was a Baptist and grandma was a Baptist and great grandma was a Baptist and mom and dad were Baptists and I'm going to be a Baptist till the day I die. Even though the Baptists aren't feeding them, aren't helping them, aren't loving them. I mean, that's just an example of the healthy, vibrant Baptist churches out there. But all I'm saying is if someone's got loyalty to something, change is hard. You know, but this church died. I was like, you must have made some bad decisions for the church to die. You know, Peter Drucker, the, the business specialist, he says that every business should put everything they sell on trial every three years. And if you don't do that, put it on trial. Is this good enough? Is this right? Is this still? Otherwise, the competition will uh, pass you by. Bill Gates took that advice from Peter Drucker and said, Microsoft Windows only lasts three years. Microsoft Word only lasts three years. Bill Gates said it like this. I think it's a really great way of looking at it. Bill Gates said, either we make Windows obsolete with a new Windows or somebody else will make Windows obsolete with a new and better Windows. That's someone who understands change, okay? We have to continually, we have, are we in the right place? Does this fit? Is, is this okay for me? Is this still contemporary? Is this still helping people? Look at the programs in your church. Is that program doing, you know? I, I had the joy of um, being a pastor now um from texas and uh he had a church of ten thousand, and i had lunch with him i was with lawson Purdue. i know his name was ben i cannot think of his last name can't think of his last name off the top of my head sorry but uh, we had lunch a phenomenal man and he, he said part of it, building a mega church like that is what you 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 kill you say well that, that that lunch in there is not helping people we're putting a lot of effort and energy into it but it's not building the church up it might, might have worked 50 years ago but it doesn't work today and so you know that that's all part and parcel of handling this change Okay. Another reason, a third reason people don't like change. Okay. Ben Daly. My, my wife has just told me now. Thank you, Amanda. Ben Daly. That was the guy's name. Phenomenal man. Anyway, 
Another reason, the third reason people don't like change is people are afraid of ridicule. This is a very powerful driving force with many people. And if you're a leader and you want to help people change, you have to be aware of this. Again, I remember the first time I went to one of these weight loss boot camps when I was trying to lose weight, you know, and then they make you do push-ups and run around and do all this kind of stuff. I, I was really aware that people might laugh at this fat boy trying to do a push-up, you know, and it really made me worry. It made me anxious. But I'll tell you what, when I got there, there were certain people there who really accepted me, created a real cultural acceptance, and they praised my progress and helped me make change in my life. And some of those people, that was um, four or five years ago, some of those people, they're still my friends today, okay? They're still probably my closest friends outside of church and Christianity are those guys I did that boot camp with. I still see some of them today. Okay, so that culture, you know, but there's a nervousness and this is a universal human desire. We want to fit in. It's a part of a human desire. We want to fit in. We don't want to be different. We don't want to be laughed at. And especially if you're the leader and you've got to just kind of go, we're going to go this way. Oh, you know, especially when things are new. Did you know, this is absolutely true. I was speaking to the, mainly the guys here, but uh, it's a football analogy. It was absolutely true. The easiest way to score a penalty in a penalty shootout, whether it's at international, any level, the easy way to score a penalty is to kick the ball right to the center of the goal because the goalkeeper is going to try and dive left or dive right. Statistically, it's been proven over and over again. If you kick the ball straight at the keeper, that's, you're, you're more likely to score. You're more likely to win the penalty shootout. You're more likely to win the game than anything else you can do. Okay? It's been proven. But no player will ever do that in a match that matters. Because there is something so ridiculous. If they kick the ball straight at the keeper, the keeper realizes what's going on and just stands there and catches it, they're going to look stupid. The fear of looking stupid stops them taking the action that makes them most likely to win. And that's a universal human trait. The fear of looking stupid stops us from doing the thing which makes us most likely to win. Some people, again, there's a, hum there's a spectrum here. Some people are more easily embarrassed than others. And as a leader, when you introduce change and you, you have to wear different people have different levels of toleration to feeling out of sorts, to feeling vulnerable to ridicule, to feeling vulnerable to be mocked. And you have to be part of that. You have to help that. Okay. Fourth, and this is true. And uh, a lot of people take things personally and change makes people feel very lonely sometimes. Most of the time when people go through change, they're changing as part of a larger group, okay? We're all changing together. The whole office is changing. The whole church is changing. The whole shop is changing. But that doesn't stop people feeling alone. I mean, lockdown, we're all, everyone's going through lockdown, but some people feel very alone in the lockdown. We're all going through it together, but some people feel very alone. This sense of loneliness during times of change, I'm just checking the time now. This sense of loneliness during times of change is overwhelming to some people. It can really overwhelm them. And we as leaders need to be kind to people who are going through that. Acknowledge that's a real feeling and help them process change. Change is not an event. It doesn't happen. Right? They're going to change everything, right? Change the process. If you're going to work on Monday, say, right, you used to work in this department. Now you're going to work in that department. Well, that, that change is going to take days and weeks and months, maybe years before it all works itself out. People are always at different stages, different willingness to embrace change, different willingness to be ready to change, and you have to give people time. You can't just throw change into to someone's life. And you have to be careful. This. this is one of the biggest things I do as a pastor is I steward the change. I, I set the pace. I've been doing a blog post on my leadership blog, benjaminconway.net, on how to set the pace as a leader. And part of that setting the pace is not bringing too many changes too quickly because people can't handle it. You can't just dismiss the people and say, stuff the people, we're going to do this. Get over it. You can't do that. It's not about how far you travel. It's about how many people you take with you. So let's talk about this process of change. Everyone understood that, that we, when we introduce change, we have to do it carefully. And I've made mistakes in that level before. I've just gone and changed stuff. And people go, oh my goodness, Ben, well, and I've, I've bruised people. Now, you're always going to bruise some people. Some people are oversensitive. But you see, you can't just change something instantly and expect everyone will be happy and follow you into that change. We had 17 people 10 years ago, 17 people in my house every week. They came and I preached to them and we worshiped God together. But 10 years ago, I was ignorant of handling change. I didn't know as much about leadership as I do now. And so 
I said, right, I've had a hall. We're, go we're going to go to hall next week. Next Sunday, don't come here. Next Sunday, come to this hall. Well, that Sunday, only 11 of them turned up because some of them preferred a house church. Some of them didn't want to be part of a growing church. Some of them didn't want to change. Some of them didn't want to open up a hall. Some of them wanted to come around a house. So our first Sunday service, we had less people than we had in our house because we lost people who didn't know how to handle change. And I, I, I might still have lost some of them, but I don't reckon I'd have lost all six of them if I'd known what I knew now and did what I do now. Now, when we moved our, five years ago, six years ago, we moved our Guildford church 11 miles. Okay, that's more than just moving it across the road to Harmony House, from my house to Harmony House, really just a five minute walk. We moved our Guildford church 11 miles miles but i was still pastoring guildford then it's before we handed it over to richard and um, i spent six sundays in a row teaching people how to deal with change i told the leaders how we were going to change i made everyone feel at home and we did not lose a single person we moved the church 11 miles and didn't lose a person okay so i want to help you prepare for change and um, i've stolen this acronym from john maxwell and everyone who wants to be a better leader should read at least one John, Mal John Maxwell book a year. It's got enough to keep you going probably for the rest of your life. Okay. John Maxwell has an acronym that helps him prepare for change. And I think it works really well. And his acronym is plan ahead, plan ahead. And I'm going to tell you what those letters stand for in plan ahead. The P is pre-decide. Okay, John, you're pushing it a bit, but it's a good acronym. Pre-decide what the change is going to be. So you're the leader. We're going to make a change. You decide what the change is going to be. L, lay out the steps to the change. A, adjust priorities. Remember, that's, that's the function of leaders, prioritizing. And N, this is so important. This is the one that I have to keep reminding myself of. N, notify key people first. That's your pre-change stuff. That's your plan. And then the ahead bit, A, allow people time to process okay change is shocking to people they need time to process head h is head into action e expect problems expect opposition expect people to come at you they will a always point to success okay we're being positive we're, we're building a picture of the future and d daily review your progress Okay, now I'll get all these to your notes. I know I've got, I've got all these notes to give you. And uh, it's just, there's been a conference on this week, if you haven't noticed. So I will sort that all out this week. Okay. And so those steps will really help you. So let's go through them. Number one, pre-decide the change. Rick Warren says this, the greatest enemy of tomorrow's success is today's success. You see, leadership can't be complacent. Oh man, look what we've done. Look what we've achieved. Look where we've got. That's great. But there's more. Okay, we need to not just be, well, it's okay if it changes and okay if it doesn't. No, we need to be a champion of change. We need to have change. We need to work out where changes happen. In Acts 6, Acts 6 is probably one of my favorite scriptures in terms of leadership and dealing with problems. Acts chapter 6, there's a need for change because the widows are murmuring. There's a murmuring. It, says, it actually says in Acts 6 verse 1, there was a murmuring arose as the number of disciples increased. People think in a growing church, there's no whinging and whining. Oh, the whinging and whining increases when a church grows. It gets worse. There's more moaning and more whining. Why? Because things change. Okay. And so in that Acts 6 scenario, um, a lot of Greeks were getting saved and added to the church. Now, the church had a very successful feeding program for widows. Okay. Back then, if, you were, if your husband died, you, you weren't going to work. You didn't have a job as a woman. And you, you had no way of making money apart from begging and prostitution. And you didn't want to do either of those. <coughs> so uh, the church would feed you. Now, most people in the church were, were Jewish. And so they, they, they had a, a great meal program for the Jews. And then the Greek women started getting saved. And a man would part of the church, would come to the meal program. And this meal program was only suitable for Hebrews. It didn't have any Greek food. They didn't have any nice food the way the Greeks wanted it. And the Greek women, you know, they wanted their food a certain way, not the way the Jewish people wanted it. And, you know, it was just, it was just an awkward situation. It was bringing tensions and moaning and whining and, and all sorts of stuff. Now, you see, what Peter could have done was say, stuff you. We're feeding you. And if you want to get fed, you just eat what's in front of you. Just grow up and shut up. And that's how a lot of pastors handle change. Okay. Now, some changes are so important that it has to be your response. Okay. 
but we're going to preach the gospel at Tree of Life. Okay, but we're, we're, we're going to have those declarations every week. And if you don't like it, tough, because I'm not going to change that. That, that, that. That's how we're going to be. Okay, so some changes are so vital, it has to be a response. But most changes, most structural changes, you can modify them as you grow to help serve people, because that's what we're there for, to serve people. Peter could have gone, oh my goodness, you need food, we need Greek food, okay, I'm going to learn how to be a Greek chef. I'm going to learn how all the Greek dishes, I'm going to do that, and then Peter's going to work all week in the soup kitchen, make everyone happy, and then Sunday morning, you're going to go, why is this sermon so rubbish? Because Peter hasn't opened his Bible all week, because he's been getting up at six in the morning to start cooking food for the Greeks. Food that doesn't know how to cook. No, what Peter did was institute a new layer leader, invented deacons, Create a new layer of leadership, pick seven deacons, all of whom were Greek, and said, Right, you guys start cooking some dinner for these ladies. Let's get that done. I'm going to go and pray and get in the word. And so we're going to have a great service Sunday. Now, that is brilliant leadership. That is excellent leadership. A good leader should be looking at these things and saying, This needs to change. There's a murmuring here. There's a moaning here. This needs to change. We need to look at our systems. If you've done it for a year, and this is anyone running their own business, any part, if you've done it for a year, be very careful how you look at it, because maybe it needs to change. If you've done it for two years, be very suspicious. If you've done it for three years, don't, don't, don't even look at it. Just change it. What, how, how are we going to change it? And so the first step is, what's the change? What change are we going to make? Once you've decided the change, we move forward. So pre-decide the change. Okay? L, lay out the steps. Remember I said the three skills of leadership, casting the vision, planning the steps, and persuading people to follow you. Okay? That's right from the very first session. So this is where you bring out your leadership skill of being able to come out with the steps. How are we going to get from here to there? How are we going to get from where we are to where we want to go? Okay, if you can't do this, then you need to find some people who can and consult them. Okay, and if you can't get the steps right, people won't follow you. Okay, and you, you as the leader, you as the one who's passionate about change, you as the one who's the, the change, we love change person, you're going to have to move more slowly than you're happy with because you want to bring everyone with you. But the good news is that every time you go forward, you increase that trust bank. Remember we talked about that last week? And it makes it easier to lead people to the next step because they realize, hey, this guy knows what he's doing. This guy knows what he's doing, okay? And so then it works and people follow you and you get better at it, okay? So you lay out your steps. You work out what the steps are, okay? Number three, you adjust your priorities. You work out what's important to get to that change. Some of you might have seen the film, The Curious Case of Ben, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. I can't even say it. It sounds like a tongue twister, doesn't it? The curious case of Benjamin Button. Benjamin Button tells his daughter, I hope you live the life that you're proud of. But if you don't, I hope you have the strength to restart. If you want to change, you're going to have to change your priorities. And this is your biggest task of leadership, setting priorities. And the biggest danger that you will have when it comes to change, and I've seen this in business, I've seen it in big businesses, I've seen it in churches, is people confuse cosmetic change and critical change, okay? Cosmetic change and critical change. Cosmetic changes are easy to make, but they don't change anything that matters, okay? I could say, right, we're changing tree of life. We're going to be called river of life. We're going to be called mountain of life. We're going to be called this. Well, this is our new logo. This is this. And then, wow, there's change. And really, you'll find that change very easy to put on people's lives. You'll find that change really easy to go, man, we've changed so much in this church. But really, it's a cosmetic change. It hasn't changed anything else. Okay? We could change, oh, from now on, we're going to go, I mean, some, a lot of things have changed with lockdown. They're all cosmetic. None of them are important. Wearing a master church really doesn't change anything. Going into the cinema through this door and leaving through that door doesn't change anything. Now, people got worked up about them. It's a conspiracy. It's a company. It's this. It's that. Because some people, people just feel uncomfortable with something new. I guarantee if we'd wear masks since we were babies and we'd always worn a mask when we went out, it wouldn't matter. Not wearing the mask would feel odd. It goes back to this again. It feels odd the way we don't do it. Everything feels odd the way you don't do it until you do it enough until it feels normal. And so cosmetic changes are quite easy, relatively easy. It's still going to be hard, but relatively, we've made a lot of cosmetic changes recently. I mean, Chris and Vaughn and I behind those screens in the cinema, that's a cosmetic change. It's not critical. They're 25 feet away from people. They're not infecting them with viruses or anything, but it's, it's a cosmetic change. It doesn't change anything, really. They're still leading worship the same way. Everything's still the same. But critical changes are hard. 
I'm talking about critical changes that change things that matter. I'm not talking about changing the color of the PowerPoint that we use every Sunday. Right? That's just a cosmetic change, but a critical change, critical change. How do we welcome new people in the church? How, how do we deal with conflict? Who are our leaders? How much power have I given the pastors? How much power have I not given the pastors? How do we handle the money? How do we do it? things that actually matter? And if you do that, you've got to follow these steps because otherwise people aren't going to follow you. And then the end of plan, the end of plan is one of the key leadership skills is don't tell everyone everything at once. I used to think that you had to share information from the early days of true life. And I soon found out it wasn't true is you have to be fair. Tell everyone at once. No, 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 no. You don't do that. You, you tell the important people first. So I have levels at Tree of Life. I have levels. In fact, we're building a fourth level right now. But at the moment, I have a level called all the pastors. Okay. Then I have another level called all the pastors and all the elders. And then I have another level called all the pastors and all the elders and all the deacons. And at the moment, we're dividing the pastors up into key pastors that are leading a church and other pastors who are not actually running them because some of our churches are not getting big enough to have more than one pastor. And uh, we're soon going to be in a position very, very soon. In fact, Richard is really starting to function that level now where we have area pastors across Tree of Life. And so before the masses know what's going on, the, the pastors need to know what's going on. The key people need to know what's going on. The same in business. The key people need to know. Okay. Now, who are the key people? Well, your structure will tell you some of the key people, but you also need to ask two massive, big questions when it comes to telling people about who's going to, what the change is. Number one, who do I need support from? Oh, this isn't going to work. Okay. Who do I need on side? And number two, who's going to fly this thing? Okay. There's no point in me telling everyone, oh, by the way, starting next week, starting next week, okay, starting next week, we're going to do a whole bunch of seminars on Saturday, all day, nine till five. And Amanda's going to teach this, and Amanda's going to do this, and Amanda's going to do that. If I haven't sat down with Amanda and said, hey, darling, how do you feel about teaching this? Could you get ready for this? Could you be involved in this? You know, most of the people who know about what's going on at Tree of Life, and again, I haven't always done this properly, the people who should know what's going on at Tree of Life more than anyone else, Chris and Vaughn. Because we need them to fly this stuff. We need them to fly the event. Okay, so whose support do I need to make it fly, and who's flying it? That, those two questions will tell you who needs to know first and you get them on side. Because if I don't get buying from the other leaders, then the plan will not work. I need all my, if I'm gonna change something big about the whole family of churches, I need the pastors on board. Because if I tell everyone the issue, and then someone starts whinging, I don't want the change to go that way, where are they gonna go? They're gonna to go to their pastor. But if I've already got the pastors to buy in, then we're gonna be okay. So I'm talking about small meetings. I'm talking about what they used, to call, they used to call in business, a two pizza meeting. If you need more than two pizzas to feed this crowd, the meeting's too big, too many people, okay? Um, John Maxwell has a, a wonderful book called 25 Ways to Win People. 25 Ways to Win People. And it's a great book in building. If you, if you struggle to build good relationships with people, I guarantee that book will help you. But one of those 25 ways, and one, my favorite one, in fact, is to share a secret with someone. So I might just not just tell everyone who, who needs to know, the pastors, the worship leaders, everyone who's going to be involved in this new service or this new ministry. I might just tell them and then tell the key influencers. I might not just tell them. I might just tell someone who I want to build a relationship with. Let me tell you a secret. Let me tell you something, I'm giving you some advanced information. It's not public knowledge, I'm gonna tell you. Why? Because I'm helping make that person feel valuable. I'm making them feel that they're part of the journey of Tree of Life, that they're included. And people always appreciate that. They always appreciate just that little bit of knowledge in advance. And that means we can then have an open discussion about these things. And people might ask questions that I might not have thought about because I don't know everything, okay? And so when the key people are on board, now you can start sharing the information more publicly. You know, if those first meetings with the key people don't go well, don't share anything publicly yet because you haven't ironed it out. You haven't got enough people buying into that change. The key people must be willing to participate or it won't work. Okay. Um, someone's asked me to repeat the book title, 25 Ways to Win People. Let me just type it in here for you. 25 Ways to Win People. On Maxwell. There you go. Okay. By giving someone advanced information before it's public knowledge makes people feel valuable. Okay, obviously you can't tell everyone like that one on one, but okay. But then you need to move into this ahead. Number one, or number five, allow people time to accept the change. People will take longer than you want to accept the change that you want to introduce. They will have free main 
responses. When you say you're going to change something, these are the free responses. I'll okay? guarantee you every single time. And they'll go through these free responses. They'll start off by going, it won't work, Ben. It won't work. It'll never work. Then they'll go, it's going to cost too much, Ben. There's not enough money to do that. You can't do that. And then they'll go, I love this idea. I've always been behind this idea. It's an awesome idea. You know? And then you need to shake the dust off your feet and go, yeah, thank you for your support. Thank you. And not get annoyed at people who suddenly claim, oh, we always supported your dream. When you know they didn't. You know they opposed you every step of the way. Go, oh, no, this is a great idea. We always knew it would work. It's amazing how many people always knew Guildford would work. Always knew that we'd have a network of churches. Never, ever supported us. Stood against us. Told us it would never happen. Told me I was doing it wrong. But we have to allow people a chance to accept the change. Change is necessary because if we're not moving forward, we're going to stagnate. And it's always better to change before something's useless and broken completely. This is your challenge as leaders. The, the challenge is, can we change? But also, can we change in such a way that people still follow us? That we're giving people enough time to accept the change, accept the new destination, accept the new way of doing things, and follow us. And when change comes nice and slow, then you can go around encouraging people to accept it. Let me give you some strategies to help you bring change in at a good pace. Number one, do it nice and slow. Number two, be plain and simple. Okay, be plain and simple and free. When you build your timeline to change something, put time to people to accept it. Make that part of your timeline. People are part of your timeline, not just tasks. So if you march forward and people are, are struggling to get a change that you're making, and you just march forward anyway, people will think four things. They'll think, one, you don't prepare well. They'll think, two, you've got some sort of secret plan they don't know about. Amazing how many people jump to conspiracy theory. Um, they'll think you're railroading them. Well, I don't want to go this way. They're making us go this way. Or well, they'll think you just don't care. You just really don't care. And if those ideas start spreading, you're going to diminish your influence, make it harder to lead. You need to slow down and give people time to accept change. Encourage people. Answer people's questions. Do not force things. Okay? Number two, communicate really plainly and simply. Be really plain and simple. Habakkuk 2 verse 2 says, write the vision and make it plain, even if someone can runs can read it. That means short, concise, direct. One of your jobs as a leader is to take this change. It might be complicated, a lot of moving parts, and make it nice and simple. Okay? So you need to make your message clear and simple. Okay? When I'm communicating change to people, I ask myself, do I get it? Do I understand what I'm saying myself? If I don't understand myself, how are you going to understand it? Right? Sometimes I've had to try and get up and explain why a certain person's leaving Tree of Life, and I don't understand why they're leaving. I, I can't get my head around. And it's amazing how many people will email me, tell me they're leaving the church, and then they go, well, we hope you understand. I'm like, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. But how do I communicate that? Um, sometimes, you know, we make changes to staffing and stuff, and I have to, why am I doing this? I have to understand myself. If I cannot understand it myself, how can I communicate it? Uh, am I saying it in a way that you're going to get it? Okay, I, 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 am I saying it in a way you're going to get it? And uh, am I saying it in a way that you're going to get it so well that if someone asks you, you could tell them? And then will they get it? And if, 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 if I'm communicating it that clearly, that you're going to get it, and then if someone asks you, you can tell them, and then they're going to get it, then I know I'm communicating on the right level. If your message cannot survive being passed on to someone else, your message is too complicated, simplify it more. That's what I'm basically saying. If your message cannot be passed on to someone else by the person you tell, then you, you, you're, you're not making it simple. You're not making it plain. You're not writing the vision and making it plain. Okay? One of the reasons people don't accept change is they don't understand the reason for the change. Once people can grasp the change, then they can accept the change. Once people understand we need to do this to get here, they can accept the change a lot better. But it takes a while for people to grasp that, and it also takes good communication. It takes good communication. Okay. And then you build that time in. If you're working with people, you need them to accept those changes before you can make those changes happen. And that acceptance time should be put into your timeline. You can even put it on your agenda. You can even put it in your formal agenda in business. Let's say we have a, a situation where people vote, a board meeting or something, trustees meeting, whatever it is. And you say, right, I'm going to present information at one meeting, but then the vote will be at a different meeting. Because why won't you have time to accept it? The, listen, the effectiveness of your change, how effective the change you make as a leader is, 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 is maths, okay? So I'll give you a bit of maths here, but the effectiveness of the change is how amazing the change is multiplied by how accepted the change is by people. It's how amazing the change is multiplied by how accepted the change is. 
okay if your change is not accepted it could be the most change uh, outstanding amazing change in the world but if there's zero acceptance anything multiplied by zero is zero doesn't matter a less amazing change that's really accepted is going to change everything it's going to be a nice high number and so that's one of the key ways you get results as a leader is by learning how to make your change acceptable to people and then we go to h head into action your key players are engaged you've communicated well people are excited and now we start making the change now everyone's going to be on board 20 percent of people are against everything okay that's your Pareto principle. 20% of people against every change. No matter what you announce the changes, there's 20% of people who are going, oh, I'm just against that. Why? I just am. I'm just against everything. You can't wait for everyone to be on board. Okay? Are you waiting too long? Once you've got enough of your key influences on board, let's start making some change. You see, we have this wrong idea. People are united behind a vision. No, vision divides people. When I present a vision, I divide people into two clear categories, people who want to go there and people who don't. And that action will actually let you know who's really with you. And then you find the people who are moving, your key players are involved, and let's get going. You'll never know if people are with you unless you ask them to do something. Now, make sure you've got your trust deposits built up and use it. Let's move. Let's get things done. And again, if you do things too quickly, you're going to go bankrupt at the trust bank. So you make your, you make your priorities, you make your choices, and you go with it. It takes trust to follow someone into change. The more trust you have, the bigger changes you can make. That, that's why a lot of new leaders who make changes very early on, before anyone knows them, doesn't work. The less trust you have, the harder it is to get people to change. Then we have to E, expect some problems. All movement has risk, doesn't it? Every time you're moving, there's a risk. You fall over. Some problems arise when you make a change. You could never predict. You could never guess that was going to happen. You could never guess that person was going to get annoyed. You never guess that person is going to feel. And, and we have this thing as people where we exaggerate the joys of the past. We all look at the past through rose-tinted glasses. And so people, when people complain, oh, it's not how it used to be. It's not how it used to be. Because they expect their life to be conflict-free. And they get upset at conflict because they have this idea, this ridiculous idea that life should be conflict-free. Well, it's conflict free when I was 15. Yeah, because nobody wants you to do anything apart from your mom and you just did it. And then people get scared about the future. This is all normal human reactions. And if you push people too hard, they push back. And you walk away thinking, why can't people see what I'm seeing? Why can't people get this vision? Why don't people trust me? Why can't all this go on and change the world? And you have to realize it's not personal. It's just change. And it will become more difficult as a leader if you take that personally. And you feel insulted by people. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> people are just people. They're just who they are, where they are. Deal with the problem, don't deal with the person. Love the person, deal with the problem. How do we deal with these problems? We always point to success. I'm rushing through the last two because I've only got 10 minutes left. Um, I've got a question here. Praise God. I'll ask that question in the second case. Great question. Always point to success. People are naturally discouraged, so we have to be encouragers. Man, we're going to win. Point to the benefits of the change. Point to the successes of the change over and over and over. During change, people are scared, they're nervous, they're anxious, they're anxious, they feel lonely. And we need to encourage people all the time with all the challenges of change, with all those negative voices. It can't be done, you can't do it, you can't build a church here. You know, um, Dorset had its first anniversary a couple of weeks ago. My goodness me, we were challenged. You can't plant a healthy church in Dorset. No one can plant a growing church in Dorset. Yeah, I can. And I constantly reminded the people that. I mean, I remember the early days, I'd go, there'd be six people there. People who I thought knew better, people I thought were wise, people I thought were disciples of Jesus go, it can't work, Ben. It's never going to grow. First person we offered the church to said, I can't take that on as a pastor because I just don't believe in it. <sighs> you know, I couldn't keep driving down a six-hour round trip after Dagnum every week. And we were an empire. And Richard and Jackie turned up and boom, they're moving, and everything's glorious. And we've got a church there. It's healthy. It's growing. It's not perfect. No church is. But it's healthy. And it's full of the word, full of the spirit. There are people that have had to change. People that have had to change their ideas, change their thoughts, and so on. And we've had to steward through that and push through that but not push so hard and push at the right pace. And some of the people who a year ago were coming on, mm, I don't think it work. They're now as loyal as can be because we didn't take it personally. That's one of the things that we didn't do. You know, me and Amanda and Rich and Jackie would talk about some of the stuff we faced, but we never took any of it personally. We, we know we're just dealing with human nature. We know we're just dealing with the problems. We're not dealing with the people, but then we always point to success. Look at Dagnum, look at Guildford. We've done this before. 
We know what we're doing. We, we, we've got a track record of successful churches. We're not in this for the money. We didn't take offerings for months and months. We didn't take offerings when we first started coming down to Dorset because people thought we were after money. I'm not after money, you know, jeepers. And so, but people didn't know that because I hadn't got my trust bank built up with people. Okay. And so, but in that time, you know, in a football team, if there's a good pass, then someone scores a goal. You know, when the guy scores the goal and everyone starts cheering the guy who scores the goal, what's he do? He points the person who passed the ball to him to let people know this is our success. And if you're the leader and people start cheering your success, start pointing to the passers. Start pointing to the people who made you a success. As the leader, you often get to score the goal. I scored the goal last night. I knocked out of the park, man. But you know what? I couldn't have preached that message without you guys, without your support, without your prayers, without you being there. I couldn't have, I couldn't have had Gregory DeCow set, set the first night without your giving. And I couldn't have get, had Greg Fritz without your giving. And we couldn't have done what we did. And we couldn't have um, had Andrew come if it wasn't for you guys, because he wouldn't have come just to preach to me, would he? You know, so I'm pointing to you guys, success, success, success. That's good teamwork. As the leader, you often get to score the goal. Make sure you pass points to the people who passed you because you've never done it without them. And then finally, the D, daily review your progress, okay? Keep focus on the goal. Are we going towards the goal? Remember, moving forward is the goal. The goal is to make the change. Your goal in life, your job as a leader is not to deal with everyone else's stresses. We deal with people's stresses because we want to get where we're going. But the goal is to get where we're going. And there's a challenge. A change will be undone until you put it into the culture of the, the group. Until it's part cultural, it can be undone quite easily. People lose sight of the change. They go back to the old way of doing things. Winston Churchill says, if you see someone successful, you see someone who's changed again and again and again. Keep talking about the change. Keep reviewing the change. What is the key? The bottom line. I've got five minutes left and I want to answer Kay's question. So what is the bottom line? The bottom line is this. Trust. Change is the test of your leadership. If you can change the culture of a group, you're a leader. And the key to changing the culture of the group is trust. Do people trust you enough to follow you into the unknown? People bind to you as a person well before they bind to your dream. The foundation is that I believe this person has integrity. I believe this person means what they say. Often leaders tell me about a vision they have for their church. They go, Ben, do you think someone will buy into this vision? And I say, that's not the right question. Will they bind to you with this vision? The ability to be trusted is what gives you the ability to change things. If you want to be part of Tree of Life, you're gonna to have to change. Everyone who comes to Tree of Life realizes that. I'm not changing. I'm not negotiating here. I'm gonna change the world. I'm gonna build a hundred churches in the UK. So if you come to Tree of Life, I'm not, I'm not changing. I'm not gonna give in to your gains, okay? Somebody said to me, they said, the most amazing thing about Tree of Life is two things. I said, what are they? They said, number one, Ben, I've never seen you use fear or guilt to get someone to do something. And they said, the second thing is no one can use fear or guilt to get you to do anything, you know? But you're going to have to change if you want to be part of this. If you don't want to be part of it, I still love you. Enjoy what you're doing. If you want to be part of it, you're going to have to change. And that depends on how much they trust you. And when you, people trust you and people realize you got, you know, they like you, they respect you, they want to be you, then you have the power to change big and do big things. You could turn a whole church from death to life. Awesome. So you need to start reflecting. Do people trust you? What can I do to increase people's trust in me? Can you articulate the critical changes that need to be made in what you're in charge of? What needs to change? And can you define the steps? Can you start defining the steps? And to change that, what priorities are important? What's important to make these changes happen? Who are the key people? What do you need to do right now? How much time do you think it's going to take people to accept? And, you know, if there's a specific, if, if there's a specific, I've talked too much this week. If there's a specific issue, then contact me personally and I'll do what I can to help. How are you going to celebrate the milestones? How are you going to celebrate that? And how are you going to review your progress every single day? What are you going to do? Those are the questions you need to ask yourself. And if you do that, you can start stewarding change and you can start being a leader and effectively changing people. Jenny's just wrote, good leadership structure helps people feel safe. Absolutely. When people feel confident in the structure, you see, but it takes time to build a structure. You can't build a leadership structure in a church of five. You can just be the leader. But as things start to grow, you start to formalize. And we talked a lot about this last week and the week before. But awesome. Kay's got a great question. What if in life, it seems like you're going through major changes and that impacts your ability to connect with people? You know, it, it, it's true. And what you have to do, Kay, is you have to prove that you can deal with those changes. It doesn't matter if stuff happens to us. Stuff happens to all of us. But how do we process them? That's what gives us credibility. And, um, you know, if I deal with the changes I'm going through personally, you know, um, the, the weight loss I've had, 
the fat loss I've had, and I know I'm not there yet, but the, 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 the journey I've had so far, that gives me more credibility with people as a leader. A man, he can lead his own self out of the fridge, then he can lead me into the land of glory. You know, and so if you deal with the changes that you're going through and deal with the stuff you're going through, and you know, Karen, I know you've got young children, you've got young children, it feels like changing all the time. It feels like they become whole new human beings every six months. You know, oh, oh man, I thought I knew how to deal with you when you were four, but now you're five, you're like a whole new human. They know stuff you don't know. Um, I remember um, Amanda, we had a, a neighbor, and Adam was very little at the time, and the neighbor had a little boy, about two years old, a little bit older than Adam. I think Adam was just a, just a baby. And uh, I offered to look after the, the, the baby boy and the man and this lady went out and I had the two kids in the house. I thought, no problem, it's the same as dealing with Adam. And so the kid needed a nappy change. I changed the nappy. In the middle of the nappy change, this kid got up and walked off. Adam never got up and walked off in the middle of a nappy change. I can't go, what? You know to get up and walk off and change the nappy? Aren't you glad God gave you your children as babies, you know, rather than like 15-year-olds? You don't have a clue, okay? So life changes, life changes. But how you process that change the personal change is actually part of giving you credibility. I'm not saying let it all hang out, but let people know, you know, when I preach, I talk about some of the struggles I've had and talk about some of the things I go through. Why? To be authentic with people, to let people know, trust, I, I, I'm walking through stuff and I've come out the other side, you know, let people know. And it shouldn't impact your ability to connect with people. It should help you connect with people. Unless of course you're dealing with personal change makes you so exhausted and so stressed out that that's what's affecting. And if that's the case, okay, get help. You're part of a family of people who love you and care for you. Get help to deal with a personal change, okay? We don't always have to be the lead goose. Even, even the geese know this. And sometimes, you know, you can step back and let someone else take the lead goose role for a bit, you know? If, if major, major changes happened in my life, I would step back from Tree of Life for a few weeks. Say, Lee, you, you run for a little bit, okay? I'm just going to step back and recover, get my speed up, and get ready to move forward, okay? And if stuff's going on, then you don't have to take that lead to this role. And one of, the, one of the things I said when I started Tree of Life was I said, in five years, I want to be able to drop dead on the spot and the whole thing keep going. I want to build a structure in place that is beyond me and beyond my ability. And uh, it didn't take five years. It took six years, but we've done it. If I dropped dead today, Tree of Life would keep going. Tree of Life would keep going, keep planting churches, keep changing the world. It would. Okay. I hope that helps. I hope, that, I hope I've caught your question right and answered it right. Are there any other questions going on praise god anymore okay so lydia says very helpful She's restructuring at work praise god and that's how yeah exactly good good again it's the same principles because people are people it should be easier with christians we should be able to pray in tongues and see stuff happening but not all christians do that not all christians uh you know ready to lay down their life 100 percent for jesus you know we're dealing with a whole bunch in a church uh maria said very well explained glad i'm really glad awesome so I'm glad that helps everyone. Um, I've taken my hour now. I want to give you a bit of a time to go and have a cup of tea and coffee and a bacon sandwich or whatever it is you do before healing or, or finances at 10 o'clock. Have a great day, all of you, and join us at half past six, man. The best is yet to come. Amen. Awesome. Praise God.